Okay, uh, let's get uh, started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is our great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Wei Jun from UMass to uh, give us a talk. Uh, professor Zhu is now an assistant professor at the Department of Mathematics and the Statistics at UMass. Uh, he received his uh, uh, PhD at UCLA uh, a couple of years ago, and before joining UMass, he worked as the research assistant professor at Duke University uh, from uh, 2017 to uh, 2020. Uh, his uh, research interest in, is in developing theories and algorithms in statistical learning and apply the harmonic analysis to solve problems in machine learning, inverse problems, and scientific computing. Uh, his research, his recent research is particularly focused on explore, explore, exploiting and the discovering intrinsic structure and symmetry within the data to improve the interpretability, stability, reliability, and the data efficiency of the deep learning. So, Wei, please. Uh, thank you, Rangjin. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, invitation. So uh, it's good to be back, at least virtually. Last time I was just uh, chatting with Yang Yang and uh, Rangjin. Last time I visited RPI was uh, five years ago. Time flies. Anyway, uh, uh, or four years ago. Anyway, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, symmetry preserving machine learning for computer vision, scientific computing, and distribution learning. Uh, while well, deep learning has somewhat become a buzzword nowadays because of the numerous success stories in machine learning applications, and the deep neural networks have proven to be extremely successful at learning from massive training data with applications, say, in image classification, autonomous driving, uh, game playing, and uh, medical uh, medicine development, etc. So, uh, uh, probably the audience are quite familiar with uh, the concept of deep neural networks or deep learning. So I'll just have a very brief introduction or a brief uh, review. So deep neural networks, whether it be fully connected or convolutional neural networks can typically be viewed as a function f uh, with trainable parameter thetas. So those can be viewed as knobs that you can tune uh, such that it forms a function that maps a input datum x from the Euclidean space rdx to uh, our output feature kc. Uh, for example, if you have a fully connected network, in this case, uh, this uh, f theta is just a composition of linear and nonlinear operations. So for the linear operation, you have a, well, affine operation, actually, the weight, weight matrix multiplication and the bias vector B. And the sigma is typically chosen as the pointwise nonlinear activation in the sense that, uh, for example, the redo activation, it sends every positive entry uh, to remain the same while the negative entries are set to zero. And, uh, well, given the machine learning task, uh, well, this output feature can see is typically fed into a loss function L that characterizes how close uh, this output can see is to a given label Y of the input X. Well, for example, in uh, image denoising, what you have is a uh, image pair X, which is the noisy image, and Y, which is the ground truth noise-free image, and uh, this C, which is the output, is a denoised image. And this loss can be chosen, for example, as the uh, discrete L2 loss between C and Y. Uh, another example will, can be image classification, where the input is a image, for example, image of a cat, and the label is indeed the class label of this cat, and this C is some probability distribution that you produce for each class. Uh, for example, in this case, it has 82% of being classified as a cat or 70% of being classified as Ron Perlman. Well, if you don't know who Ron Perlman, there he is. And you can see the resemblance is uh, actually kind of uncanny. Anyway, uh, so when we say we train a deep neural network, at least in the uh, supervised training or supervised learning paradigm, what you have is you have a collection of labeled training data, pairs, XI and YI. So xi is the input, yi is the label, and you want to find the optimal theta, theta star, uh, that minimizes some loss function capital L, uh, which can be typically defined as uh, the empirical mean of the loss function uh, between uh, the output and uh, the label. Uh, when we say this model is successfully trained, that means well, each ci is matching yi based on the loss function. And hopefully, if you have seen enough data or enough high fidelity data, uh, the model can generalize onto unseen, uh, uh, unseen 
uh, images or unseen uh, input data. Okay, uh, so the problem about the uh, deep uh, deep neural network or deep model is that well, uh, for this model to uh, generalize well, uh, typically is if you do not have any prior information or you use a black box f theta as a feature extractor or produce some output, typically for this to generalize well, you would require uh, abundant high fidelity data or high quality data to uh, perform. Well, uh, one way well, in order to improve the data efficiency of the model, uh, sometimes it's very beneficial to inject the structural information of the learning task uh, into the model design f theta. And uh, this is essentially the main topic that I, I want to convey, main message that I want to convey. So let's look at uh, the first part where I will introduce um, Deformation robust symmetry preserving machine learning, and this is actually a series, uh, a collection of works that I've uh, been working. Sorry, a series. Well, I, I said series. I didn't mention Siri, and uh, Siri somewhat popped up in my computer. But anyway, so this is a series of work that I uh, conducted with my collaborators at Duke, uh, uh, Duke uh, University of Washington, and uh, Purdue, and also at UMass. All right, so. Uh, the reason why I want to look at symmetry is because uh, symmetry is ubiquitous in machine learning. For example, uh, image classification, where given the image you want to tell the class label of the image, then you will see that if you shift this image, uh, image of a cat to the right or to the left, uh, the class label remains the same. Uh, what this means is that, well, this class label is a symmetry. Uh, a translation is a symmetry with its, uh, this class label has a symmetry with respect to the translation. If you shift the image, the class label remains the same. Uh, similarly, if you have an image segmentation uh, where your job is given the image, you want to figure out which uh, class each pixel belongs to. For example, this pixel belongs to a car, this pixel belongs, belongs to a row, pixel belongs to a tree, etc. Well, in this case, again, translation is going to be a symmetry. Uh, well, the segmentation will have a translation symmetry in the sense that if uh, the input is translated, the output, the segmentation mass, map should be translated as well. And uh, the re one of the reasons why CNNs are uh, very useful or perform very well in computer vision is that uh, CNNs are intrinsically translation equivariant uh, because of the uh, convolution operation. So here what, uh, what we have is if you have an input, uh, if we model it as a 2D continuous signal, so X is a function that maps a spatial location, say U, U is a coordinate in R2, it is mapped into a number, so you can think of it as an intensity. X of U is the intensity at pixel U. So if you first convolve it with some filter, uh, this is the output, you can translate the output. This is the end result of the first computation chain. Uh, on the other hand, you can first translate the input and then you convolve it with the same filter. And you will see that these two results are the same. Uh, these two results are the same. Uh, or what we, so essentially the diagram is cumulative if you have a convolution operation. The way it remains is that, again, if the input is translated and the output is translated accordingly. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of computer vision tasks that would prefer translation equivariant models, for example, image segmentation, uh, motion estimation, object localization, etc. And uh, you will see that uh, for these kind of uh, tasks, you will prefer uh, equivariant model to uh, other group transformation. For example, uh, symmetry with respect to uh, scaling. If you have a input image and then rescale it, shrink it, and enlarge it uh, by a factor, then you would uh, require or you would prefer your model can automatically produce a output that is rescaled as well. Uh, however, the, the CNNs are not well equivalent to other important groups. And in this part of the talk, I hope mostly looking at the scaling transform. And indeed, if you have an input, you convolve with some filter and then you rescale the output. Uh, it's not the same as you first rescale the input and then convolve with the same filter. And uh, so the problem, the question is how can we, well, modify this uh, convolution operation such that uh, this diagram is cumulative again. And there are actually quite a few works, uh, many works that related works on building equivariant CNNs. And there are some contemporary work on uh, building a scale equivariant CNN as well. But what is typically lacking in this field or in some of the previous work is that uh, there aren't that many theories that guarantees the stability of the equivariant representation. Now this is <clears throat> indeed important uh, because 
uh, in reality, the transformation, symmetry transformation is not going to be perfect. You want to gauge uh, how equivariant or how, how closely equivariant uh, the model is, uh, even if the input transformation is not perfect. And this will come up later on. So uh, before diving into the, uh, well, the, the construction of scale equivariant CNN, let's look at uh, or a more a broader definition of equivariance. So if you have a two spaces X and Y, and you have a mapping F, uh, mapping from between, and you have two group actions, DG and TG, defined on these two spaces, X and Y, uh, then we say this mapping F is uh, G equivariant, or equivariant with respect to uh, the group G, uh, if and only if well, this diagram is cumulative. Uh, in our previous case uh, for translation equivariance, then, uh, well, the trans the group actions are both translations, and uh, the mapping F here is the convolution map. And uh, a special case of equivariance is invariance when you take the second uh, group action to be the identity map. In this case, it means, well, transform it through some group action and then map through F is the same as mapping F on X itself. Okay, so now let's see, well, with this well definition of equivariance, how can we uh, modify the, well, the well, convolution essentially uh, to construct the scale equivariant CNNs. Well, when I, when I say scale equivariant CNNs, what I really mean is equivariant model that are equivariant to tra a scaling translation group. So it's the semi-direct product between the scaling group and the translation group R2. So I will look mainly look at images here. And for now, we'll consider <coughs> the continuous we model image as a continuous signal. So it's uh, supported on the entire plane. So well, as a set, this group is just R cross R2, where the first R corresponds to, well, this is a group operation with respect to scale, so how much you want to scale the image. And the second R2 corresponds to how much you want to shift the image in the plane. So to construct that, let's uh, have some intuition. So if you have a, let's look at the difference between fully connected network and the convolutional network and see uh, what's the difference between those two that uh, gives convolutional neural network translation equivalence. So if you have a fully connected network, if you throw away all the nonlinear operation and the bias vector, then essentially what you have is a weight matrix multiplication. So if this is the previous layer feature map, you can view it as a vector of dimension, say, M L minus one. And to compute the next layer feature map, what you have is just multiplying this vector by a matrix W. And uh, well, this is essentially what you have for a fully connected network. And uh, in a fully connected network, there is typically no uh, structure within this vector, well, even if you have a 2D image to begin with. Uh, after vectorizing the signal, it's gonna be a discrete vector. So for this reason, I will call this lambda dimension uh, the uh, discrete unstructured channel. You can think of it as say uh, RGB channel, channels that doesn't correspond to the signals. And uh, things get a little bit different when you look at a convolutional neural network because instead of just having this lambda dimension or the unstructured channel, you also have a spatial channel, U corresponding to uh, the location of the pixel. And to compute the next layer feature map, you do not, on not only have a, again, a weight matrix multiplication essentially in the full, uh, in the unstructured channel with respect to lambda, but at the same time, you have a spatial convolution uh, with respect to the spatial channel U. So this is indeed the convolution in the normal sense. Okay, now, we know it's, it's a spatial convolution that gives uh, CNN a translation equivariance. Now, if we want to build in a scale equivariance as well, then we probably want to do something similar. Or at least this is one way to do that. You want to sneak in another dimension alpha corresponding to the scaling group. And uh, to compute the next layer feature map, now those signals are, are also augmented by uh, uh, another another channel alpha, and to compute the next layer feature map, you want to do some sort of uh, group convolution, a convolution with respect to this group, and we will define what this means. All right, now let's put this thing into a, a picture. Uh, so you have an image or the original input signal. So U again is the spatial location, and lambda can be viewed as the unstructured channel. Again, think of it as say a RGB channel of an image. And we have a group uh, well, a group operation, uh, uh, group action on the input, uh, which beta corresponds to, well, we want to sh well, rescale the image to, to, to the beta, and we also shift the image by a vector V. So this is the input uh, group action. 
And we want to construct some architecture at theta uh, and that you have some action on the output as well. So on the, for the output, you still have, uh, for the spatial domain, you still have a uh, uh, translation and uh, scaling to two to the beta, but at the same time, there is a alpha minus beta or shift in the scale channel. This is actually corresponding to uh, the regular group representation uh, of the scaling group. Uh, of the uh, is a regular group representation of the scaling translation group. And uh, what we want to construct is, well, how can we design this model such that this diagram is commutative? So what we have shown in this paper is that, well, if you have a feed forward neural network with uh, the group action defined in the previous slides, then the only way to achieve that is, well, is the following. So sigma is uh, some sort of a pointwise nonlinear activation. So it maps a number uh, so in this case, it maps a number into a number. You can say the ReLU activation. And in the first layer feature map, what you have is, well, it's essentially, it looks like a, a wavelet transform because, well, X naught is the input. The input, again, is only having spatial location as an index and uh, unstructured channel as an index. And to compute the next layer feature map uh, at the spatial location U and, uh, well, scale channel alpha, what you do is you convolve the input uh, with a filter that has been rescaled to two to the alpha. So it looks indeed uh, very much like a wavelet transform, uh, but it's not really wavelet because it's uh, L1 normalized. So it's actually a modifier so because you're living in R2. So L1 normalizing uh, this filter is just uh, multiplying to two to the negative two alpha. And to compute the next layer feature map, so starting from the second layer to uh, all the subsequent layers, you not only have, well, you, you're actually doing some sort of a trans, uh, convolution with respect to the group. So the filter is not just supported on the spatial domain, but supported on both spatial domain on the scale channel as well. And to put this into picture, well, uh, to, again, the first layer feature map, what you have is a something that looks like a wavelet. So to compute the channel at alpha one, the scale channel at alpha one, you convolve the input with a filter that has been rescaled to two to the alpha one. Again, to calculate the channel at alpha two, you convolve the filter with, uh, convolve the input with a filter that has been rescaled to another uh, scale. And starting from the second layer, you want to do some uh, convolution with respect to groups. So you, you will see that it's convolution with respect to both the spatial domain R2 and the scale channel alpha. So at a different uh, scale channel, there is actually information transfer as well. Okay, so this is the, uh, essentially the most general way to impose scale equivariance if the group actions are defined in uh, thusly. Uh, well, uh, this is something I alluded to. Well, we know if the transformation is perfect, then indeed that the previous architecture or the previous model can help you impose scale equivariance. But in a lot of cases, uh, the transformation is not going to be perfect. Uh, for example, uh, if you have taken an image and uh, if taking an image of some uh, object and now either the object is moving away from you or you're moving away from the object. Well, apparently the, the object is going to be shrinking in size. Uh, well, you can model it as a scaling transformation. But if you have some, say, uh, camera location change, then the scaling transformation is not perfect. Instead, it's modeled, for example, as a composition of a deformation of the input and the perfect rescaling uh, of the deformed input. So in this case, we'll see that, well, usually uh, you're not going to have a perfect rescaling, but instead you have some deformation map. So the deformation map is uh, defined with respect to some tau or the distortion, uh, local distortion attached to a point, so it's a vector field. When tau is equal to zero, so it's a zero vector field, then there is no deformation. When tau is very small, then it's, uh, there is a small deformation in the input. So now we want to gauge is, well, if you have some small deformation in the input, then you have two results. Well, two results, uh, and now we want to measure whether these two results are still very close, even if you have a small deformation. And uh, to do that, uh, the idea is fairly simple. Well, you want to filter out some f high frequency response uh, in this deformation. And the way to do that is that we can choose a regular uh, set of filter to work with. So instead of working with some arbitrary uh, convolutional filters, we uh, work with uh, convolutional filters. Well, recall that in, in the well in this convolution, uh, you have a filter that is supported on both the spatial domain and the scale channel. So you can decompose the convolutional filter into both uh, into a separable 
uh, under a separable function basis. So in the spatial domain, we take uh, Fourier vessel basis, which is the eigenfunctions of the Dirichlet Laplace and supported on the unit disk. And uh, so it's an orthonormal basis. And for the scale channel, it's the same thing. You take it as a uh, orthonormal basis on the unit interval. And then what we want to do is you truncate the basis expansion to only low frequency exponents. So because, well, the filter is something you, you still want to train because it's a trainable parameter of the model. But these basis functions are fixed. And instead of training this filter directly, you are training, uh, well, the expansion coefficients and you truncate it to low frequency components. And uh, well, one clear advantage is that, well, if you only just keep a couple of filters to work with, then the number is limited in this case. Uh, the computational cost can be reduced and the model size is reduced as well. Uh, the other benefit is something I mentioned before, it can improve uh, the deformation robustness. So we can show that if, uh, well, during this basis truncation, we can guarantee if you have a small tau measured by a gradient tau and tau, uh, then the, these two responses or uh, well, the, the diagram is still going to be approximately uh, 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 commutable in the sense that these, these two outputs are very close. Okay. And uh, well, this is when you have a single group action, or actually not single group, it's a scaling and translation. What happens if you have some other group, for example, rotation, then you can also just build that in by doing a convolution with respect to that group as well. And uh, we can also show that, well, even if you're adding a rotation group, you still have the same result, a similar result in the sense that the diagram is still gonna be approximately commutative. All right, uh, one of the benefits that you can gain by well, building such structure uh, to be robustly preserving a scaling translation symmetry is that it improves the uh, classification result when you have a large scale variance in the input. So we're working, for example, at these two synthetic data sets where the images are either uh, are rescaled randomly. We can show the first row is the uh, result of a vanilla CNN, so it doesn't take care of any uh, scaling variation of the input or it's not scale uh, equivariant or scaling variant. And the subsequent uh, uh, rows are our model, but truncated to uh, different frequency components. Uh, if K and K alpha is large, it means you have a more basis function to work with, you have a larger model. And uh, we can see even if we just truncate it to 10, 3, we can still shrink the model and improve the result. And actually, if you tr truncate a basis function to, say in this case, uh, to only just 10% of the, so the ratio corresponds to the number of trainable parameters. So if you truncate the uh, number of bases such that the tra trainable parameter is reduced by a factor of 10, the accuracy can still be improved if you're just the training on very limited training samples. Okay, uh, so this is the benefit. Well, we also have some other result uh, I'm not showing in the talk and uh, please refer to our paper uh, if you're interested. And uh, this is the benefit that you can gain in computer vision by con constructing a model that can respect the symmetry uh, for, uh, for the task you want to perform. And uh, this idea of preserving symmetry is also very useful uh, in data-driven scientific computing. For example, if we look at a uh, data-driven solution of partial differential equations, so here you have a, a heat equation on the bounded domain uh, with uh, the initial condition and the Neumann boundary condition. And uh, one uh, one line of work that has uh, gained a lot of attention recently is uh, the physics informed neural network, uh, or PINGS for short, uh, uh, developed by George Kalnidakis at Brown. And uh, I'm stealing one of the figure from the paper. So essentially what you do is you want to represent, well, you throw away the grid or, uh, or mesh for a, um, uh, solving a PD. So instead you just represent the solution uh, using a neural network. So it's a function, it's a map that maps a input coordinate, say xt, uh, into u of xt. And uh, you want to train this model, meaning that you want to tune those theta such that u is indeed a solution. And this is done by, well, minimizing a loss function uh, constructed from the PD, uh, but at the same time, the initial condition and uh, the boundary condition. So uh, in a lot of cases, well, uh, it's getting a lot of traffic attention and uh, indeed it's called physics informed neural network because it consider uh, the PDE to work with. And uh, in a lot of cases, well, this physics is not really uh, enforced 
correctly if you don't have that many training samples to begin with. And uh, another way to look at physics informed neural network is that, well, can you uh, build additional sy symmetry information that is known to preserve, that, should know, that is known to uh, present in your solution directly into the solution representation. And as a very simple example, we look at uh, the Uploic Logic model, which is well, this model here, which uh, can be viewed as a, a discrete counterpart of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And uh, you know a priori that the solution should uh, uh, present uh, PT symmetry, uh, which essentially it's a uh, symmetry with respect to Z2, uh, Z2 squared. So if you flip the spatial domain, the solutions remain the same. And if you if flip the time domain, if you it's a time reversal, then you, the solution should take the conjugate. Uh, aside from that, you also have some other structure. For example, we know uh, what for these type of uh, solution uh, for for these type of um, equation, the solution will either have a spatial uh, temporal uh, time periodicity, or or we the, the, there is just a PT symmetry in this case for Peregrine solar time. Okay, so uh, the idea is, can we build a symmetry into, uh, well, building symmetry into such solution, whether it's, it's still gonna, is also gonna improve the solution uh, in the small data region. And indeed, it is the case. For example, in one of the solid time, mass solid time, which is uh, time periodic, but uh, in the spatial domain, it is symmetric. We can show building symmetry directly into the solution and compared to the just the generic pin or vanilla pin, well, you can see the pin doesn't really enforce symmetry, which is an important physics, uh, which is important to physics that you want to enforce. And the symmetry is enforced after uh, constructing the solution in such way, and the solution can indeed be improved. Okay, uh, for other cases, when you have a uh, space periodicity or uh, just a PT symmetry in the solution, we can always improve the solution tremendously. All right. Uh, this uh, is the first part of the talk, which we talk about uh, symmetry, the use of symmetry or uh, robustly uh, preserving symmetry uh, in a model, uh, uh, such that uh, we uh, the model can perform uh, you achieve, achieve data efficiency. And in the second part of the talk, I will not I will look at uh, structure preserving generative adversarial networks. Uh, essentially, uh, how symmetry can be used uh, in unsupervised learning or learning a distribution. So what are generative adversarial networks? Well, since their introduction by a good fellow at all, uh, this GAN, generative adversarial networks, or GANs for short, uh, have become a very burgeoning domain in uh, distribution learning. Time again, finding a lot of innovative applications, for example, in uh, generating uh, human face images or images of uh, animals, or in this case, it's actually Quite, in, uh, quite interesting, you're given a caption and you want this model, uh, you want a computer to generate an uh, image that, well, uh, to which the, the input text serves as a caption. So the, the picture you're seeing are all generated by a computer, they are not really taking an image of a real person. And uh, what this is doing is essentially, well, you tell, well, you, you want this computer to learn uh, the distribution uh, of human faces or uh, animal faces, et cetera. Okay, uh, intuitively speaking, GAN can be well, understood quite easily. So essentially, GAN uh, is a mimax game between uh, two components uh, to learn a unknown distribution Q. So Q in this previous slides can be like uh, human face images, the distribution of human face images. So Q here is an unknown target distribution. Uh, we don't know what Q is. Uh, we only have access to Q through a finite, for example, a finite uh, collection of samples. So you have a finite collection, albeit it might be very large, of, uh, of uh, human faces. And uh, the first component of the GAN is a, a generator, which is typically a neural network that is trying to push forward a random noise source. So the random noise is something that you pick, for example, a, uh, a prior distribution, say, uh, uh, Gaussian distribution. And the generator, the job of the generator is to push uh, a random noise source into a distribution PG. Uh, so this PG is the push forward of uh, this noise source by the generator. And you want this PG, the push forward distribution to match Q, the unknown target distribution. And how do you tell these two distributions are close? And here is uh, the, where the second part of second component of uh, GAN comes in, the discriminator. The discriminator is usually also 
uh, parameterized by the neural network, by a neural network. And uh, the job of the discriminator, as I said, is to uh, tell the difference between these two. And this is accomplished by, well, by maximizing uh, this energy functional. Essentially, what it does is if it sees uh, a sample, a real sample, a real, uh, real face image, it wants to assign a high value, say equal to one for a real image, and it assign a low value for you know, a zero if you see a fake image. And uh, at the beginning, if this generator is not that good, it's this PG is not going to be close to Q, uh, then this gamma can, uh, it's very easy for gamma to tell the difference between real and the fake images. But as the iteration goes on, or as you solve the Mimax game, uh, eventually a PG is going to be very close to Q in the sense that the gamma is not going to be separating those images uh, that well anymore. Okay. So uh, this is the intuitive uh, understanding of GAN. Well, mathematically, you can formulate the GAN, or GANs can typically be formulated as minimizing some uh, divergence. Uh, you can think of a divergence as a, a notion of distance between probability measures. So it's minimizing some divergence between uh, these two probability measures, Q and PG. So again, Q is the target distribution that you want to learn, and PG is the distribution that is generated by the generator. And uh, this divergence that is that you want to minimize typically have a uh, typically has a, a variational characteristic. So this divergence can be viewed as supremum of some well test function. Or well, in the previous language, uh, this test function is a discriminator. The job of gamma is to tell the difference uh, between Q and PG. And if you take the supremum of this guy, it tells you the difference between these two distributions. So indeed, if you formulate it this way, G is the generator again. It's pushing forward a prior distribution into PG, and gamma is a discriminator. It tells the difference between Q and PG. And indeed, a lot of GAN can be formulated in such way. Uh, for example, the original GAN, it's, uh, it's related to minimizing the uh, Jensen-Shannon divergence, and you also have the F GAN, uh, which uh, minimizes the F divergences, uh, gamma IPN, uh, which subsumes uh, which is a more general uh, case of Wasserstein, uh, Wasserstein GAN, and you also have the Wasserstein metric or the normal Wasserstein GAN and the sinkhole divergence. Okay, so uh, indeed we have a, a GAN is a very uh, powerful framework of a learning distribution, and uh, it works very well if you have a lot of training data, you have a lot of images sampling the unknown distribution cube. But uh, in a lot of cases, uh, well, you don't have that many training samples. Either the training samples are hard to hard to collect, or they they aren't, or it's intrusive to collect those data. And one example is well, well, well so one one way to achieve this. Well, if you don't have that many training data, you can do data augmentation. It's just augment the data. Uh, this is one way. Uh, the other way is to well, can we again gain some knowledge of the distribution that you want to. Uh, approximate or uh, that you want to learn uh, using some structure information. So, for example, in a lot of distributions uh, that we encounter, some of the uh, many distributions that we encounter do have uh, group invariant or group symmetry. Uh, for example, for this medical image, when you collect this medical image, you do not have a, a, a orientation uh, preference. Then, in this case, uh, these uh, distribution should be. Uh, for example, invariant to the rotation group or uh, the ref reflection group. So what this means is that if you have an image and you rotate the image or reflect the image, the likelihood should remain the same. So if you have this uh, additional uh, information about the underlying, sim uh, underlying uh, probability measure that you want to learn, uh, well, can you build such symmetry into the GAN training uh, such that you can improve, uh, again, data efficiency again? All right, so now the problem becomes, again, you still have the uh, GAN setting, but we have the extra information that Q is invariant with respect to some group sigma. Well, I changed the notation to sigma here because I reserve G as uh, a symbol for uh, generator. So sigma now becomes a group. Uh, sorry about the confusion. And we say uh, a probability measure is invariant with respect to group if if you pick a random, if you pick an arbitrary group action, uh, it will push forward uh, the distribution into the same distribution. So, uh, in the previous example, if you have a 
medical image rotation is a group action. Rotating the image will give you the same likelihood. So the distribution is going to be the same uh, after the group transformation. And we'll call uh, the space of all sigma invariant distribution uh, P sigma of X. Okay, so now let's see. In order to, well, to build this structure or this additional symmetry into your learning process, what we want to do or what's the structure we want to impose on the generator and the discriminator? Well, well, if you have, a, we know Q is a sigma invariant probability measure, then it makes sense to, well, to only generate uh, probability measures that are invariant with respect to the same group as well. So it makes sense to generate only sigma invariant PG. And this can be accomplished later on. We'll see that if you choose a random noise to be uh, the distribution to be sigma invariant, and you only choose a sigma equivariant uh, generator. So now if you're given, originally you have some class of generators, and we use the notation here to denote uh, the subclass of that generator that is known to be, that, that, that is uh, equivariant with respect to the group. Okay, so this is uh, for generator. We, well, intuitively, we want to pick only equivariant generators. And now let's see, this generator, assume it will push forward to a invariant distribution PG. And now for a discriminator to, discriminator to tell the difference between Q and PG, these two distributions, it makes sense to only consider uh, sigma invariant discriminators. What that means is that, well, again, if you have an image, you know after transforming, rotating the image, the likelihood is the same. Then this discriminator should assign the same value uh, for images that are rotated or reflected. So you only want to look at, well, intuitively, you only want to look at uh, discriminators uh, that should uh, invariant under the group transformation for, for image. So, so wait, right. so, can I, yes. can I clarify something? Yes, please, go can ahead. Go to the previous slides. Yes. So in the image case, right, the translation and the rotation is an image domain. But I thought the mm -hmm. probability measure is the measure defined in the ambient space because you stretch your image as a vector in the high dimension space. So there, yes. so that T sigma is sort of you translate the image, then you, re, you induce a group action in the ambient space. That's that's what you call T sigma, is that, is, am I right? Oh, you can think of them. Uh, so image can be viewed, uh, for example, uh, it's, uh, you, you, have a, you have a space that is uh, R2, for example. Sure. And R2, the space of image should be viewed as functions on R2. Yes. Right? And you have a group action applied onto uh, images, which is rotating the image. So, and uh, you have a probability measure that is uh, supported, uh, it's supported on images. Well, so but it's, I thought uh, the probability, probability measures. Sorry, I thought the probability yes. is, is, is the probability of the whole image. Is it is a set of oh, images no, no. in ambient space? No? Uh, yeah, it's the probability, yes. It's the probability of whole image. Given a single image, it will spit out a probability. So the probability is on the space of images. That's, 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 that's what I'm thinking, right? That, but then the translation, yes. your, your translation is applied in the R2, not the, not, not the yes, uh, space. Yes, if you have a translation in R2, it will induce a translation of, you can lift it onto translation of signals. Right. So it's kind of like a, you have a group action that is on the R2, and you have an image can be viewed as a function on R2. Yeah. Right. And uh, the translation on R2 will induce a translation of images or translation of signal. Essentially, originally you have a G applied onto X, it, X is a point in R2. And now a translation uh, LG applied onto a signal F, LG applied onto F of X is just the F of G inverse applied onto X. Yes, yes, yes. And you have the, the so, 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 sense. yeah, yeah. But then that T sigma is like induced. When you do the rotation translation in the R2, then you induce the rot whatever. Onto sigma. Yes. In, uh, in, uh, in ambient space. Because in reality, you also discretize that, right? That will become oh, sort it, of a, Permutation, yes. Permutation in a, in a, in the ambient space, in some sense. Yes, that's right. Okay. Well, for now you can think of it every 
signal is modeled on R2. So there is no discretization, at least for now. Okay. And uh, so you have a ambient space that is R2. So it's the pixel location. Sure. And you have a space of images and each image can be viewed as a function on R2. Sure. So there are two group actions. The first group action is on R2, the shift of pixels. Yes. And the second group is action is on images, the translation and rotation of images. Yeah. And uh, you have a probability measure that is a uh, probability measure on the space of images. That's right. So each image has a likelihood. That's right. That's right. Thank you for thank you for clarifying. Yes. Right. Thanks. Yes, that's that's the setting we're working with. So the Thanks. probability of the measure is the probability measure of images. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. So now, well, uh, again, the thing we want to do is we want to learn a distribution that is known to be invariant with respect to a certain group. Uh, in the previous setting, given an image after rotation, the likelihood is the same. So the probability measure on the space of images uh, should be rotation invariant. Okay, and, uh, and also I mentioned that uh, the, the idea is to use equivariant generator and to use invariant discriminator. Okay, to prove the main result, we want to look at the two uh, a symmetrization operators. So th the first symmetrization operator is with respect to a bounded measurable functions. So given the functions, for example, it's a function. So now we, the space we are working is just R2. Uh, so it, this is just for a picturization. So assuming that you have a group that is C4, so rotation only four 90 degrees rotations. And uh, you have a function that is equal to four at a single point. And the symmetrization of this function, uh, the bounded measurable function, uh, is just uh, spreading uh, this density into four different parts after a rotation by 90 degrees. And each one is just a one after uh, rotation. And uh, this is a symmetrization of function, but also correspondingly, there is a symmetrization of a probability measure. So now it's a probability measure that is uh, supported again on the space R2 and symmetrizing this a uh, probability measure is actually a do operator. Uh, you can define it using the do formulation, and it's again spreading it uh, under the C4 group. You just uh, spread the mass into four different parts. Okay, so using this uh, two symmetry opposition, uh, symmetry, symmetrization operator, we can talk about the main result, which says, well, if uh, the symmetrization operator applied onto the space of all uh, discriminator. Again, uh, we uh, we originally have some space of discriminator to work with, and uh, assuming that uh, this uh, well this technical condition is satisfied, we will later on see it's actually not that hard to satisfy. If this is the case, and assuming further that P and Q are both invariant with respect to the group. So Q, again, Q is, uh, you can think of Q as some uh, distribution that you want to learn, and P is the distribution that you generated. Okay, if these two distributions are the same, then uh, the divergence defined by the test functions in the larger test space, the, the original test space gamma between Q and P is the same as taking the divergence, while this time the test functions or the discriminators are only taken from the smaller space. So in this case, what this means is that, well, if you know P and Q are two sigma invariant distributions to begin with, then looking for the divergence or the inner optimization with respect to gamma can be shrinked to only a smaller space, which includes only invariant uh, discriminators. And this is beneficial because first you have a smaller space to work with, so um, the optimization is supposed to be easier to do. And the second thing is, well, it actually imposes essentially an unbiased regularization to prevent a discriminator over, overfitting because you know discriminator needs to be invariant, so you don't have to search for non-invariant discriminator anymore if you know P and, G, P and Q are both uh, invariant distributions. So this is the first part. If uh, we know P and Q are invariant, then we just need to search for invariant discriminators. And that the previous key condition can be satisfied quite easily. And uh, well, the first one is simple. If it is uh, one of the special case, if you have a finite group, and if you're assuming that the test function space that you picked to begin with uh, is convex and closed under the group action, then it's fine. And more generally, you can extend it to some uh, more technical results. 
Okay. All right. This is uh, one thing we know. If P and Q are both invariant, then you just need to work with a smaller space of invariant discriminators to tell the difference between these two distributions. However, well, the next result we show is that if if you don't do it carefully, you just uh, shrink the discriminated space to smaller, but uh, one of the distribution is not invariant, then you have some problem. And in this case, let's say P and Q are two arbitrary distributions. They are not necessarily invariant. Then uh, using smaller space of discriminators, so invariant discriminators to tell the difference between Q and P is the same as using uh, the larger space of discriminators, so more discriminators, not necessarily invariant, uh, to tell the difference between symmetrized Q and P. Okay, this is a uh, very interesting, or it will lead. Uh, well, it, it means that if, say, if you are one of the distribution Q uh, is not invariant, then uh, uh, well, Q is invariant. Then Q is going to be equal to S sigma of Q. Uh, but P is not invariant, so P is not necessarily equal to its symmetrization. So in this case, what it means is that if you shrink your test function space, it will only tell the difference between Q and B, Q and P after symmetrization. So even if Q is not equal to P, but they are the same after symmetrization, then using a smaller space of invariant discriminator is not going to be telling the difference because if S sigma Q is equal to S sigma P, then this is going to be equal to zero. And so this is going to be equal to zero, but P is not necessarily equal to P, now Q, not necessarily equal to Q. Okay, and we will show a numerical result here. So here we have a target distribution Q that is invariant under C4. So it's a rotation with 90 degrees. And uh, the first row shows the result where we do not impose any structure on the generator or discriminator. So it's a vanilla generator discriminator and just a normal GAN setting. We we'll see that if the iteration goes on, we only have uh, 200 training samples. It's actually a little bit complicated. The problem is embedding in a 12-dimensional space. In this case, it will, it, will, it will eventually learn the distribution, albeit not, not that well. Uh, and also takes a long time. Uh, but still, you will be able to learn the distribution. However, if this time the Q we know is invariant, but if we do not enforce the generated distribu distribution to be invariant, then that, that means we use an invariant discriminator, but uh, we do not impose any structure on the generator. So the generated distribution is not invariant then in this case, we'll suffer from mode collapse because you're learning a distribution that is only sampling a single mode. And this is indeed enforcing the theoretical result here because, well, indeed the discriminator is, is doing its job. It's just, well, it's telling the difference between the symmetrized Q and the symmetrized P. Indeed, uh, the learned distribution after symmetrization is indeed equal to your distribution Q. Uh, uh, t uh, mixture of T distribution uh, uh, presenting uh, exhibiting C4 symmetry. So what this message, is, uh, or the important message here is saying, if uh, you want to shrink your hypothesis, uh, shrink your uh, discriminator to an invariant, a subspace of invariant discriminators, you better be sure that the generated distribution is indeed invariant, because otherwise you, you're almost certainly are going to learn a distribution that suffers from mode collapse. Okay, so now the question is, how can we enforce uh, the learned distribution is indeed uh, invariant with respect to the group? And this is actually a very simple result, which is something I alluded to before. If you have a prior distribution that is invariant with respect to group, and you will only work with uh, equivariant generators, then the generated distribution or the push forward distribution is guaranteed to be invariant with respect to the same group. And this is just a, a single line of proof, essentially. It's just a uh, equivalence between these two uh, diagram. Well, uh, this only, well, the result, the, the, well, and you, you can see the figure. So the first line, uh, the first row shows the vanilla GAN. So you have no structure for generator or discriminator. And the second row is you have invariant discriminator, discriminator, but the generator is not equivariant, meaning that the learned distribution is not forced to be invariant. In this case, we will suffer from mode collapse. And now if you combine both the invariant discriminator and the 
equivariant generator, then you will learn a distribution uh, much better and uh, in much uh, smaller time frame. And uh, this is something interesting is that, well, you have to be very meticulous in designing your equivariant model. So this is somewhat like if you just uh, screw up, screwed up a little bit in designing your equivariant generator, uh, you will again suffer from mode collapse. And this is one of the, actually just one of the previous work by another group of people. All right, and uh, let's show some results. Again, if you just, this improved the training, pro improved again, le distribution learning uh, tremendously, especially when you have a very small training data to begin with. Uh, if you're just uh, using vanilla CNN as a generator and discriminator, you're not gonna learn a meaningful uh, rotated digits. So if the, now we're working with rotated MNIST where MNIST images are rotated uh, uh, uniformly and uh, randomly in 360 degrees. And if you combine both equivariant generator and invariant discriminator, and if you work with C4 group, so assuming that you just rotate it 90 degrees, you'll get some already uh, much improved the result. And if you imp uh, increase the group to C8, uh, the, the result can be even better. And this is just some neuro, uh, uh, numerical quantification of the of evaluation of the result, FID, uh, the Frechet inception distance. So the smaller means better. Indeed, indeed uh, quantitatively, we can measure uh, the difference of the different architecture as well. And another example is, well, if you have a medical image, uh, as I mentioned before, it represent, uh, it will exhibit, uh, exhibit uh, rotation and reflection symmetry as well. And if it just we use a vanilla model, which is a vanilla generator and the discriminator, you'll see that the image that generated are not quite well, uh, are not that good. And uh, if you again uh, put a additional symmetry structure into uh, the model, the images generated will be much better. Uh, this is another uh, data set uh, it tells a similar story and uh, we'll see that again, uh, combining uh, structure, in, uh, putting structure into uh, both generator and discriminator will yield the FID much better compared to the baseline. Okay, uh, the thing I talked about is uh, group symmetry in uh, learning uh, group symmetric distribution, but actually this framework can be uh, extended to uh, to not just group, group symmetry, but actually uh, stru uh, structure preserving as well. If you have some structure uh, with respect to a probability measure that you you know to present, then you can just uh, conf constrict uh, your, uh, to learn the distribution or generate the distribution to only sample to, to be blind in this manifold. And then the discriminator is telling the difference uh, of the probability measures over the manifold. And we have extended the result to struct other structure preservation as well. I unfortunately don't have time to talk about it, but uh, if you're interested, please uh, refer to our paper. And it has actually a very nice application in molecular dynamics uh, cross graining as well. All right, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, here are the uh, four papers uh, related to work and uh, I'll be happy to take any question. Thanks Wei, for the very, very uh, interesting talks. Uh, any questions?